For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. But what does this verse actually mean? There's a deeper meaning that many of us have missed. It's found in 1 John 5, verses 7 and 8. Water and blood are intertwined all throughout the Scriptures. Look at the following examples. On the cross, water and blood flowed from Jesus' side. The water of the Nile River turned to blood. The Israelites' Passover required blood, and then, after they passed through the water of the Red Sea, water and blood are at the entrance of the tabernacle. The priest would first offer blood sacrifices on the altar, and then would wash in the water of the basin. The second angel in the book of Revelation poured out his bowl on the sea, and it turned to blood. The scriptures symbolically say that we wash our robes in the blood and they turn white. John 19.34 describes the piercing of the Savior's side by the soldier. First, John 5.8 concerns the Messiahship of Jesus, which is proved by three witnesses. Jesus is the one whom at the baptism, God attested Jesus as the Messiah by the heavenly voice. This is my beloved Son. Also at the crucifixion was the testimony that the Father had accepted his atoning sacrifice by all the foretold signs that took place at the moment of Jesus' death. And finally, the promise of sending the Comforter fulfilled on Pentecost presented us with the final proof of the completed messianic task. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. Now I'm about to show you something that you might have never heard of. If this isn't a picture of Jesus Christ, I don't know what is. These are the instructions the priests were given in the Old Covenant in order to cleanse the leper. The priest shall order that two live clean birds and some cedar wood, scarlet yarn and hyssop be brought for the one to be cleansed. Then the priest shall order that one of the birds be killed over fresh water in a clay pot. He is then to take the live bird and dip it, together with the cedar wood, the scarlet yarn and the hyssop, into the blood of the bird that was killed over the fresh water. Then he is to release the live bird in the open fields. The cedar wood is the cross, the earthen vessel is Jesus' body, and the water is the Holy Spirit, and the blood is the blood of Christ. There were two birds needed for the ceremony, one to die and one to live. One shed its blood, and the other was covered with the blood, but was released to fly free. The one bird represented Christ who bore our sins and by whose stripes we have been healed. And the other live bird, coated in the blood of the sacrificed bird, represents the new life we have in Christ. We live under his blood. Let's look at the moment that the disciple John records where a soldier pierced Jesus' side with a spear after his death. And immediately, blood and water came out. John emphasizes this detail as an eyewitness, suggesting he saw it as highly significant. John also discusses this in his first letter, adding meaning to the event. He says, This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. He then refers to the Spirit, water and blood as all being witnesses to Jesus at the Messiah. At first glance, the significance of these words might not be clear. However, two things are apparent. Both blood and water are related to Jesus' death. Although they are related, they are distinct and should be considered separately. The Bible connects cleansing with both blood and water. For instance, 1 John 1.7 says, The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. It also says that water cleanses us in Ephesians 5.26. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her. 
having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. To understand these cleansings, we can think of them as addressing two major effects of sin, guilt, and defilement. Blood. This represents Jesus' death as atonement for our sins, removing our guilt and providing forgiveness. It cleanses us judicially. Water. This also represents Jesus' death, but focuses on ending our sinful state and separating us from our old way of life. It cleanses us morally and breaks sin's power over us. Two substances came out of the Lord's pierced side, blood and water. Blood is for redemption, to deal with sins for the purchasing of believers. Water is for imparting life and the cleansing of the church. The Lord's death on the negative side takes away our sins and on the positive side imparts life into us. Thus, it has two aspects, the redemptive aspect and the life imparting aspect. Hebrews 9 and 10 emphasize the power of Christ's blood, contrasting it with animal sacrifices. The chapters explain Christ's blood cleanses the sinner's conscience. It removes the sins of those under the old covenant. It establishes a new covenant. It offers a once-for-all cleansing, clearing the believer's conscience permanently. It grants believers boldness to enter God's presence. It sanctifies believers, setting them apart for God. The key point is that Christ's single blood sacrifice is enough for our judicial cleansing, never needing repetition. The recurring words one and once in Hebrews highlight this truth, yet moral cleansing is also necessary. We need daily renewal, symbolized by washing with water, to maintain our purity in this defiling world. Just as priests needed to wash daily, we need continual moral cleansing. In John 13, Jesus washes his disciples' feet with water, symbolizing ongoing moral cleansing needed for communion with him. This shows that while Christ's death provides complete judicial cleansing, we still need daily moral renewal. We get this cleansing through the Word of God, which reveals the power of Christ's death and cleanses our hearts. As Psalm 199 says, How can a young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to your word? John 3.5 refers to being born of water and the Spirit, linking back to this cleansing process. It's not about baptism, but about the new life and nature we receive through the Spirit's application of the Word. We need this cleansing not only when we sin, but also to stay pure in a defiled world. Both the blood and the water are crucial. The blood provides eternal cleansing from guilt, while the water offers daily moral renewal. The Lord's pierced side was prefigured by Adam's open side, out from which Eve was produced. Both of their wives were produced from their sides. The blood was symbolized by the blood of the Passover lamb, and the water was symbolized by the water that flowed out of the rock. The blood formed a fountain for the washing away of sin, and the water became the fountain of life. Jesus' death opened two fountains to meet all our needs, a fountain for washing away our sins and a fountain of life. Zechariah 13, 1 says, In that day there will be an opened fountain for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, for sin and for impurity. And Psalm 36, 9 says, For with you is the fountain of life, in your light we see light. We can be washed at the fountain for sin by confessing any sin we commit. And we can receive the divine life by continually coming to the Lord as the fountain of life to drink of Him. We can forever enjoy the provision of these two fountains, the water and the blood.